Exciting times. Um, uh, we are going to kick off the session with Minal Mid uh, Midas. She's Principal Analyst of Consumer Research Lead at Ampere Analysis. If you're not reading Ampere Analysis data, you really should be. So, Minal. Thank you everybody and that was a great introduction so thanks a lot. Um, so as mentioned I'm Manal Motor. I'm Head of Consumer Research at Ampere Analysis and today I'm going to be taking you through how sports leagues can leverage streaming to engage audiences a bit more effectively. So to start off we're going to look at a very macro level. When we're looking at global sports spend North America is really driving this with high value deals in the US for the NFL, the NBA, and MLB. On top of that, you have substantial deals for the likes of NASCAR, WWE, and UFC. In Europe, football dominates. Domestic leagues perform particularly well in their home markets, and the Premier League is the most obvious example of this. And then on top of that, you have competitions like the Champions League, which command large fees in their own rights. Now there is a but here. Although the likes of DAZN, Viaplay, ESPN Plus have been increasing their live sport portfolios, actually by the end of this year, Ampere forecasts that they'll only make up a small piece of the global sports spend pie. In fact, when you take just pure OTT platforms, so that removes anybody which has linear operations like Sky, we estimate that it will make up 8.5% of global sports spend by the end of this year. Now, this just doesn't align with consumer preferences and what they're telling us about how they want to watch live sport. So from our survey of sports fans, younger demographics are telling us that they actively prefer watching live sports via OTT. 36% of them agree with that statement with only 20% saying that they want to watch via linear broadcast alone. The rest of that demographic, they don't mind what they're watching on as long as they get to watch live sport. But it's also worth noting that nearly a quarter of older demographics also actively want to watch live sport via OTT. So this isn't a phenomenon that is just amongst younger demographics. This is happening across that age spectrum. If I had stood here about two, three years ago, I probably would have said to you that OTT is a really good way of engaging those hard to reach younger sports fans. But the data is now showing that that just isn't the case and that the viewing habits that we're seeing from entertainment where there's a big shift towards OTT, that's now following through to live sport as well. And when we start looking at some of this data regionally, there is some progress being made. So this chart shows the proportion of European sports spend by different types of buyers. And that orange line at the top represents pay TV. And you can see from the graph that historically they've always had the highest share of sports spend in Europe because for so many of them, it has underpinned both its customer retention and acquisition strategies. However, that navy blue, dark blue line at the bottom, that represents sport OTT. And what you can see is over the past few years, it's been increasing slowly and slowly. So much so that by the end of 2021, it represented 10% of all sports spend in Europe. And by the end of 2022, Ampere forecasts that it will double to 20%. But it's not just about leveraging live rights via traditional OTT. Now, from our research, we know that live is by far the most important form of content. But there are lots of other ways that rights holders can use digital and streaming services in order to engage their audiences. So more than eight in 10 sports fans are watching clips or highlights of a live match. Those aged 18 to 34 are 13% more likely than average sports fans to watch this type of content. So it really shows how important short form content is for them. At a platform level here, YouTube completely dominates. 62% of people who are watching clips and highlights do so on YouTube and Facebook slash Meta is a distant second. Staying on the topic of short form content, over the last few years, we've seen a huge rise in engagement with 
videos by sport influencers or with athletes as fans are looking to get closer to the action, but also athletes want to get their own name and their personalities out there as well. And platforms like Twitch and TikTok have really helped to facilitate this. But it isn't just about short form. There is very much room in the market for long form content as well. And the rise in popularity of sport documentaries is testament to this. In the last few years, we've had really high profile titles like The Last Dance, All or Nothing, and of course, Drive to Survive. So if we look at engagement with sport documentaries in a little bit more detail, we can really start to unpick this rise in popularity a bit more. Now this chart shows the proportion of sports fans who are engaging with sport documentaries at least a few times a month. Now on average, about two thirds of sports fans are watching at this frequency. And from this chart, you can see that fans in Italy are over-indexing in their engagement, and those in the US are under-indexing. However, even in the US, nearly six in 10 sports fans are watching at this frequency. So that potential audience to capture is still huge. So what is it about sport documentaries that have made it such an important content strand over the last few years? Well, if we look at this Venn diagram, we can really begin to understand the opportunity that sports leagues and rights holders have when it comes to partnering with subscription video on demand services. Now, from our wider research, we know that 41% of internet users are sports fans, but 78% of them are SVOD subscribers. So already you're starting off with a much larger potential audience size. If we look at the crossover here, we can see that over half of the audience are unique to SVOD. So what this will allow sports rights holders to do is get themselves in front of an audience that would otherwise just not be available to them. So it's bringing that potential audience and making it even bigger. Now, arguably the best case study in recent years has been Netflix and F1's partnership for Drive to Survive. Season one dropped back in 2019 and season four launched earlier this year. And if you're anything like me, you binged it all in a week. But what this chart is showing is the average popularity of the title since it first launched. Now, it's not surprising that there is a peak in popularity every time there is a new season. But what's really interesting here is that growth in overall popularity for the title that we're seeing. So with every new season, you are getting a new audience base and you're being able to build on that and actually make it bigger every time. And actually, this is having a very big impact on F1's audiences. And it's actually changing the fan base. So this graph is showing the growth slash decline in F1 fandom amongst those people who are 18 to 24 between Q1 2019 and Q3 2021. Now you can see from the graph that APEC is the only region where there has actually been a decline in fandom among that demographic. Now while F1 maybe hasn't been as successful in engaging that younger demographic there, Actually, if we look at overall interest in F1, it's grown by 6% in that region. And it's growing amongst older consumers who enjoy watching sport documentaries. So you can infer from that that whilst it might not be hitting some of these younger demographics, actually Drive to Survive is still having an impact on F1's reach in that region. Across all other regions apart from LATAM, there's double digit growth. So why has it been so successful? Personally, I think lots of it is to do with access. The series gets, gives you the opportunity to, excuse the terrible pun, but get under the hood of the sport and get you closer to the team drivers and the principals. Their personalities shine through. You feel like you're getting to know them as people. And all of a sudden, you want to know how well they're doing. We get told, from a marketing perspective that to engage younger demographics, you need to have storytelling and you need to have authenticity and they will really respond to that. I mean, storytelling, the series has by the bucket loads. We have a nar an exciting narrative arc that goes throughout the season and you really know what you're getting with it. Authenticity, I mean, we can argue until we're blue in the face whether Lando Norris and Daniel Ricciardo really hate each other or not 
but Netflix are definitely hitting a mark there as well. And when it comes to reality TV, there's always going to be an element of artistic license that's involved there. Now, when F1 started all of this back in 2019, their demographic in terms of their fan base skewed significantly older. And so Liberty probably thought we need to do something about this. And they took a punt on something like this documentary. And the data is showing that it is having a genuine impact on the fan base. And it shows that other rights holders are now beginning to jump on the bandwagon. Earlier this year, Netflix signed deals with PGA Tour and ATP to have sports documentaries. And they're both sports that have similar older demographic skews. So they'll be looking at this type of data and thinking, that is exactly where we want to be in three years' time. But it's not just F1 who is benefiting from this relationship. Crucially, F Netflix is also growing its share among F1 fans. So in Q3 2021, 64% of F1 fans had household access to Netflix, compared to 53% in Q1 2019. Now that's an uplift of 21%. Now that growth outstripped the organic growth we were seeing amongst internet users as a whole. So as a result, Ampere estimates that Netflix has made an incremental $40.5 million worth of revenue purely from the Drive to Survive series in terms of additional subscribers. So what does all of this mean in terms of sports rights holders? Well, OTT is beginning to play a bigger role for live sport content, especially in Europe. But leveraging streaming doesn't have to be limited to sport OTT platforms. There are lots of other ways that leagues and competitions can use content in order to diversify their audiences. Now that includes social media, clips and highlights, or sports documentaries, which we've obviously delved into in a bit more detail. All of which can help to both serve existing fan bases, but also to find new ones as well. Thank you. We've got time for a couple of questions. So do we have any questions out there? I know I've, cer I've certainly got some. Uh, so my first question for you is, you mentioned very specifically that the sports documentaries seem to really be engaging with older people. The data that I'm, sh I'm seeing is suggesting that younger people are be actually beginning to disconnect from mainline premium sports. What can those organizations do to re-engage people with those sports? So I guess from that data that we saw earlier, it is having an impact on younger demographics because F1 is being able to grow that demographic for them. So sport documentaries can still play a part there. But if you look at our data for where younger audiences are over and under indexing in terms of interest, the NBA does well, WWE does well, as does the NFL. It's all these American sports where it's linked and intertwined with entertainment. There's a good Instagram celebrity culture there. There is really strong digital social strategies. And that is where maybe some of the more traditional rights holders need to start focusing in order to really capture the attention of some of these younger demographics. Right. And, um, sorry, um, quick look, no hands, no questions. Um, last question. One of the other things that I've noticed is that sports leagues, not, they're not just, they don't, just seem to not be responding to the need to uh, provide digital delivery to the young. They seem to be retrenching around the old medium. So I see them signing extremely long contracts, like the NFL in the States, for example, has just signed a 10 year contract out to 2033, mm. which primarily relies on broadcasters to deliver the product. Is this sane in this world? I mean, I suppose they would argue that 10 years worth of broadcast revenue gives them a lot of stability. Um, and what I imagine there would be, there will be clauses in the contract that will allow for that content to be seeded across those broadcasters' digital platforms so that they're not so, say, if it's with NBC, Peacock will get some of those rights just to make sure that they are being able to capture audiences across the spectrum. I would be very surprised if they're only signing linear-only deals at the moment, and if they are, 
I don't think I'd agree with that right now. <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's a couple of odd rights that they've sold to digital providers, but it's, it's fundamentally mm. still behind uh, linear. Yeah. Anyway, we'll be seeing you in a couple of minutes. We will. Thanks.